Good morning, BBC Houston. Jesus is alive. He is risen. Amen. Would you rise to your feet this morning? God, we thank you, Lord, for you are our risen King. Father, we celebrate you. You are victorious, God, because death could not hold you down. We worship you in this place in Jesus' name.
give the Lord another round of play, praise. You know, this past Friday, we all gathered here at VBC Houston to remember what Christ did on the cross for us some 2,000 years ago. And, you know, when you think and look at the images that you see um, in movies such as Passions of the Christ, it's a very sad thing to witness to see Jesus being punched, bruised, and nailed on the cross. But praise the Lord that that was only day one. And on th day three, which we are celebrating today, the women found the tomb empty early on that Sunday morning. And that angel of the Lord told them that he is not here, but he has risen. And praise God for that because our Savior, Jesus, wasn't on that cross. He wasn't left in the tomb, but right now he sits on the right hand of the Father where he belongs. And praise God for that because as believers now, we have that access to the Father where we can have this awesome relationship with Him. And so He is so worthy of our praise. And so at this time, let's continue to worship Him through our giving. If it's your first time here, we just want to welcome you. You don't have to participate in this. We just ask that you will fill out the connection card in front of you so that we can get some information just to you know, send you some updates about what we are doing here at VBC. For those who are watching online, you can give uh, at our website at vbhouston.com. And so if you have your offering out right now, let's lift it up and give this time to the Lord. Father God, we just join collectively together with you right now. And we just worship you, God. Lord, we thank you, God, for your plan for salvation and for the gift that you have given us, God, through your son. If we only just accept him, Lord, we can have eternal life and spend it with you, God. We thank you, God, that we don't have to earn, God, our salvation. But the reality is we never could. And so, God, you knew that. And so you sent the, your one and only son to do that. And God, we thank you, God, that you gave your best, God, in your son. And so, God, we gather here this morning, this Sunday morning, where we celebrate the risen Jesus Christ. God, we give our best in our giving and our offering. We ask, God, that you bless it and that you use it, God, to expand your kingdom and allow it, God, to just bring that message of hope, God, to everyone that we encounter, God. Lord, that, that they may know that their sins are forgiven through your son. And we thank you, God, for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for Resurrection Weekend at VBC Houston. We are so glad you are here. Man, today is a beautiful day. The sun is out, you all are here, and it just feels so alive today. Did you get that? No? All right. Anywho, if this is your first time here, stick around after service. We've got loads of awesome festivities and treats planned for you, including lunch. But in the meanwhile, go ahead and fill one of these bad boys out so you can be in the loop of our weekly newsletter. Plus, it helps us get to know each other better. When finished, hand it to one of our ushers before you leave today. Alrighty folks, without further ado, please help me welcome up Pastor Michael Trung as he shares with us the word. Good morning. All right, I am so glad to be here this morning. It is a Good morning to celebrate Resurrection Sunday. The sun was beautiful, or is it? Uh, it's beautiful right now, is it not? I mean, just a few days ago, it looked a little different, but we are so glad to celebrate this beautiful day, this momentous occasion. 2,000 years ago, like Minna pointed out, some women were in for the shock of their life when they discovered that their master, their teacher, Jesus, was not in his tomb. I can only imagine the shock of not just being surprised, but literally you're going through shock from the death of a loved one, only to be shocked again because someone stole the body. I don't know what that would be like, but it would be totally something horrific and um, memorable as well. But we thank God that it wasn't just a bad memory, but it was the beginning of something great, and it's a, uh, a deciding factor in the lives of people. So we welcome those of you here for the very first time and we say happy Resurrection Sunday or happy Easter, so if you're familiar with that. Here at VBC, we call it Resurrection Sunday because resurrection is the most important day of the Christian uh, believer's life, and we always want to focus that. Uh, Easter, bunnies and eggs, that's cute, but we 
absolutely believe in the resurrection of Jesus because without resurrection, there's no power to overcome death. Without resurrection, there's no fulfilling of promises. Without resurrection, we have no power and authority over the things in our life that challenge us. And so I'll share with you a little bit about that. We're glad you chose to be here whether, wherever you are, those you here on site as well as those you online. So we are so grateful that you have joined us. And of course, um, as Sonny said, please stay for the festivities. We welcome you. We've planned a really great afternoon. We hope that you would stay and enjoy it. Now, we, we've, been, we've been inviting and we've been sharing and using the terminology Resurrection Weekend instead of just Resurrection Sunday. And it's because it's the entire weekend that is valuable. It's not just Sunday. It's not just Friday. You know, without Sunday, Friday was just good intentions uh, and, 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 and a good heart. And, and without uh, without Sunday in itself, then, then there's no power to fulfill what God has said. But now that we have Friday, which met the laws and requirements that God has, and on Sunday is the power to overcome death and so much more, we have the full scope of what it is to be a believer and to experience that. You know, at, at times what happens is, as uh, Christians and as the church in general throughout centuries, what we have done is we have broken up the idea of God. And so what we say is that what God did for us is he died for my sins, or we said he resurrected. And we, we speak less about the resurrection, we just mostly talk about what he's done on our behalf and for our sins. But we have to speak about the whole thing. We, we have to speak about his life, his suffering, his betrayal, his death. And we have to say that he died completely because the requirement for sin is death completely. But not only did he die, but there was three days because three days was the allocation that showed that he was truly dead, but also that he can overcome something that no one else in history has ever overcome. That is death. Name me one person that has overcome death. I remember when I was in middle school, there was a man in Waco named David Koresh. And he said, Kill his body and I'll rise again. And we have not heard from him since. There have been great religious leaders in times past. Even before Jesus was officially born in the physical flesh, in the flesh. Who have said that they were God or they are God and they died and people have their toenails and their hair. Now if you are God, why would someone have your toenails and hair? That's nasty. But... If you were to disprove Christianity, all you have to do is produ produce the bones. And 2,000 years plus, and they have yet to produce the bones. You know why? Because the, empty, the grave has always been empty. Because Jesus, yes, was buried, but three days later he rose again, and there was never opportunity for that decay because Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive today. And that's why we have our faith and we place our hope in him. Amen? And as believers and as those who attend, we must live as if Christ is dead and not still hanging on the cross. Christ hung on the cross Friday to pay the full penalty of sin, but he rose again to say that the penalty of sin was not the only thing that we needed power from, but we not, not only needed forgiveness, but we needed the power to overcome the sin that so easily entangled us, the sin that we were born into. Day one, God made us into his own image. And, and, and one thing that we have to understand, and what I want to do is now, if I can just rewind just a little bit, touch base for those of you here for the very first time. Some of you were here Friday, and Pastor Sam shared about day one, and I, I want to just briefly touch on this. So in day one, we have to understand this. What led to day one, what led to Jesus on the cross was first, we have to understand, is that Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 tells us that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. See, God made us in his own image to have a relationship with us as a father to his children. That was God's intention. God's intention was to, to make us so that he can enjoy us. You may ask the question, why would God want to do that? And I've shared with this before. Why would any sane parent have children? Have y'all not heard how hard it is to have children? Have y'all not heard the crazy stories we hear about children? And don't even talk about teenagers. I kid you, I love your teenagers. I work with youth for a very long time. But you hear, you read these stories about children are suing their parents and children are shooting their parents. So why would any parent, why would any happy couple want to introduce that type of trauma in their life? And women, you literally have to deal with trauma when you birth a child, don't you? Do you not? And some of y'all do it 
a few more times. But yet we do that because of love. And I can tell you my children are two of the most wonderful moments in my life and I just praise God every single day. But God is the same way. God made us, his intention was to be in relationship with us, but the problem was our forefathers, our ancestors, they did something. Because they had free will, they had the choice to choose, and they chose to go their own way, and they disobeyed God. And disobedience equals sin. And because of that, that introduced sin and the curse of sin into our, le- our life. And so not only beginning from Adam and Eve, but it passes on to each and every one of us. See, disobedience introduced the curse of sin into humanity, which includes you and me. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Sin leads to death, a physical death and a spiritual death. So not only physically here, but there's a spiritual connectedness that we had with God in the garden. And when Adam and Eve disobeyed, that, there was a disconnect. Because see, God is righteous and he cannot be in the place of sin. And so he had to distance himself from his own creation. And from then on, before, until Jesus came, the relationship with God and man was through someone else, through a mediator. People no longer were able to pray to God directly or speak to him directly. They would have to pray through someone. What Jesus did was that he restored that relationship. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But see, death is the result of sin. And Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of, uh, of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus saves us from those wages of sin. Now, death here, we're not, we're not talking about God saying that we can live physically forever, but he's saying that we will live spiritually and in a resurrected body forever. There will be a moment for that, and there will be other times. We hope that you would join us for subsequent service to learn more about these things. But God wants us to be alive in him. God wants to restore the relationship that was originally intended in the Garden of Eden. See, sin was not about whether you are, sin is not about whether you are a good or a bad person. Let's, let's get that straight right now. Sin is not if you are a good or bad person. Did you know that? Turn to your neighbor and say, sin is not because you are good or bad. This is what sin is. Sin is simply missing the mark. It is simply not meeting God's standard. Are you still going at it? You see, so it's not a matter of I am a good person I don't, and I don't need to be forgiven. It's a matter of I have not met the requirements of God because there is sin in us. We are born into it. And because of that, we need God. We need his deliverance. We need Jesus who will lead us to him, who has made a way for us. See, by, by definition, sin is missing the mark, and sin is not doing more bad than good. Because a lot of people, what we do is we say, okay, you know what? I, I know I'm not a good person, or I haven't been a good person, but you know what? Let me go and fix myself. I'll, 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 do, I'll do more good stuff. I'm going to volunteer in the community. I'll stop cursing. I'll stop making fun of him, or I'll stop watching this and that. And what we do is we try to increase more good than bad. And you know what? That's not just unbelievers. Christians do that too. We say, God, God, I promise you that I'm going to do this right. God, I promise you after camp, I'm going to get my life right. (coughs) But what we don't realize is that what we're doing is we're trying to get out of sin on our own. And the Bible tells us that he made a way for us. The Bible tells us we are a sin. And the problem with sin is, is this. God is a God of love, and he's also a God of righteousness. And because he's a God of love, he, he wants to save us. But he's righteous, so he must judge sin. So that's the challenge that we have. We have a God who must judge sin. Think about this, if you're parents. You love your kids. But you've got to judge. You've got to correct them sometimes. And that's what God has to do. Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. The Bible tells us God made a way for his people to atone for their sins. Hebrews says, 922, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. See, 
What God did was he knew that we could not be right with him. We could not do all the laws that God required. So God said when you sin, you can sacrifice an animal, a particular animal. And depending on if you're rich or poor, there are certain types, certain prescriptions. But there had to be blood. But that was temporary. So every time someone sinned, if they had the money, they would sacrifice the animal. Sometimes I feel that if that was me, I'd have to do it very often. You see, along the way, God foretold of a day when he would send a solution, a permanent solution, and that solution is in Christ Jesus. That's why I baffled the mind that Jesus would not come in on a horse as a prince, but he came in a manger, in a stable, filled with hay and animals. People thought that God would send his son to be born of a king, but they didn't realize that God had intended for Jesus to be most, so that he would not be intimidating, but he would be able to be so approachable to every one of us. Because we don't need a more formal God, do we? We need an approachable God. Because even as we try, as believers sometimes, we come across unapproachable sometimes. But what we need to present to people is that God is very approachable. Our God was approachable. And there was a qualified lamb that was perfect and met all of God's requirement. And that was the promise of Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, it says, For Christ has also hath once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. You see, God loved us. In John 3, 16, it reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the most popular Bible verse. I know it's kind of sad, it's kind of sad but I learned that Bible verse while I was skipping Sunday school. It's something, there's something about that Bible verse that captures you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. You, you don't realize the value of an only son until you have one for yourself or an only child until you have a child for yourself. You would do anything to protect him or her, and the last thing you would want is to hand him or her over to someone to be abused or made fun of. Those of you who are fathers in here or mothers in here, I know you would never do that, but can you imagine God the Father sent his one and only son, knowing that the abuse that he would take, the pain and suffering that he would go through, and the ultimate sacrifice that he would lay day down. But God the Father willingly did that because his love was so great that he would send his son for his people, for people who are undeserving. Romans 5.8 tells us that greater love has none of this than that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrated his own love, and while we were yet sinners, he died for us. God loved us before we even loved him, before we even acknowledged that we were wrong, before we even recognized that we needed him, God had already loved us. And this morning I want to say to you, if you don't know Jesus, God has already loved you. He loves you now. You didn't even have to make a decision for him to send his son. He did that for you. And as believers, this is a reminder for all of us that God loved first, therefore we must love first. Amen? Sometimes we love with 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 conditions or, or we have this little disclaimer underneath, I'll, I'll, I'll forgive if that, but the Bible says that love precedes, love goes before us even if what someone else should do should come, what that we think should come before that. That's why God has called the church to be the example. And Jesus at one time says, a new commandment I give you, and what was the new commandment? That is to love one another. And then he concluded, he said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We are to love one another as the body of Christ so that the world outside will see that there is an actual group of people who love each other, not because they have to, but because they choose to, amen? So today as we move forward in our life, whether it's at home, whether it's at work, or where we go, be reminded we are to love where we are regardless of what other people say or do to us. That is ultimate obedience in following Christ. 
This all leads us to day one. Because the sin, the challenge, the things that we do. On Good Friday, we were reminded that Jesus came and died for us. And at the cross, he took our place. We have a video illustration I want to show you that uh, just gives you a quick glimpse of Friday into Sunday. Isn't that beautiful? That's such a wonderful video. I really enjoy that. The betrayal, the flogging, the illegal trials, the crucifixion. It was for us. It was for you, and it was for me. Even if you're not a believer, Jesus suffered and died for you. Because that blood that was shed, that pain that was suffered, was given to everyone. And in order for us to fully receive it, that's called grace, is to receive something that we don't deserve. So we get to day three. See, day one is significant, but it's not complete. Jesus' death was required to pay for sins and to redeem us from the effects of sin. See, that's called the curse. The Bible says that we are cursed. We, we, we are actually slaves to sin. So before you become a believer, the Bible says that you're slaves to sin. You either are slaves to sin or you're a slave to God, the Spirit. So you choose one or the other because one, you go your own way, yes. But you struggle to remain powerful in it because you have your, something's ruling over you, but the other allows you to live in freedom. You, in the flesh, in the sin, in the, the law, the, 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 the law of, the, uh, of sin, requires that you meet all of the requirements of God's law, which the Bible tells us is none of us can do it. Because at some point we can try our best, but we will fail. Because we are not checklist people. We keep on trying to do all the checklists just to do what's right, but God does not want a relationship with people with checklists. And those of you who have significant others, can you imagine if your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend had a checklist of things they're supposed to do? I mean, sometimes maybe women, you feel this way with guys, we just do this checklist and think that it's okay. When I first got married, that's what I learned, you know, do this, do this, do this. But it gets to a point where you, you have to understand that it's more than the checklist. It's the relationship. It's more than the apology. It's the meaning behind the apology. It's more than the gift. It's the intention behind the gift. When we think about Jesus, who is the gift from God, 
We think about that intention. See, God did not just give us a gift so that we can have and put it in our pocket, but God gave us a gift so that we can utilize it in our life and to be free and to live in what he has for us. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become the curse for us. For it is written, curses everyone who hangs on a tree. So when we talk about the curse of sin or the living by the law, or we talk about um, the sinful nature, they're all the same thing. When, when we disobey, when, when our ancestors disobey God, they introduce sin into us. And so we have this, these chains of power. And I want to use this here. I want to get this right because this could go really wrong. So give me a, give me a second here. The pastors and I, we, we, we tested this out. And, uh, and then, you know, we ran all the, you know, the scenarios that, oh, man, if, if I mess up, this could, be really, this could be really embarrassing or it could just really, be really bad. So I, I, wanna, I want you to envision here what I have right here. Just these chains. And, and the beauty of these chains, there we go. This is very sturdy. I actually took this home, and my daughter, she's only two years old. She just turned two. Oh, beautiful baby. She just turned two, and uh, she saw me wear this, and she thought that I was trying to wear jewelry. <laughs> and she wanted it on her neck. So guess what I did? I put it on her neck thinking that she would say it was too heavy, and she was gangster. <laughs> like, she, she let it go, and she was like, mm-hmm, it's cool. And anyone of you know my daughter, you know that's her, right? But this thing is, you know, it's not that light. The Bible tells us that we are born with this sin nature. We are cursed under the law. And so we carried this with us before we knew Jesus. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he died to... That it was the price that was required to forgive us of our sin. But that, now, that was not fully all. There was, that was not the full power that was required to deliver us from sin. You see, he can forgive us of our sin, but if he remained in the grave and he doesn't rise again, then we would not have power over sin. So then, after we're forgiven, we will still struggle to sin again and again. And here we talk about, you know, why did he come back to life? That was the price that was required, but also we needed the power to overcome sin. See, we were born under the control of sin. And Galatians 5.1 says this, For it is freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again with a yoke of slavery. Again, the same idea, the yoke of slavery, the burden that we have in us. And this is, you know, the lying, the cheating, the addiction, the way that we think of people the murderous thoughts, how we treat people or mistreat people, that's what this is. So even if you can try your best to do all the good things, what we try to do is we bargain with God and we say, God, if I do this, you would do this for me. Or God, I, I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to give more money so that it will be less, it will be more good than bad. And what God is simply saying is the problem is you give more money and yes, it would seem there was more good than bad, but you still have sin in you. You still are cursed and you carry the yoke and slavery to sin. So what happens is then we have these, these concrete blocks here which represent all the actions that we take that are sinful or that miss the mark in God's standard. So it could be the way we think. It could be how we treat people. It could be the habits that we continue to possess in or, or continue to, to, to do even when we know it's not good for us or someone or anyone else. We mistreat people. We think of people badly. And so what happens is then these chains they come and they go and they, they just, they keep on going. And of course, those cinder blocks, those, those blocks are heavy. We, we have these chains over here and, and it's different things. And so what we do is, the Bible tells us that we, because we have the sinful nature, then we get stuck with these. And, and we're not sure what we're going to do. It, you know, we pull it here and there. And, and see, some people, it doesn't catch up to them as much, but until at one point it limits them and they can't go further because 
sin gets you at some point. And so the issue for us is we need deliverance from this thing here. But it's, it's not just the addiction. It's not just the mistreating of people. It's, it's not just all these different straps that we put in. But what happens is eventually we get locked up and we find that our, our sins are heavier and we're not able to go far or where we want to go. And we find that we're strapped and we're not able to carry on with what we want to do and we feel that there's no freedom for what we need because it begins to pull us away from where we need to go. And this here is the issue. You see, those things are symptomatic. Because what we do is we, we get addictions and we go to AA. And we try really hard to get free. And, and you know what? Maybe, maybe what happens is we'll, we'll try really hard with AA. And we'll, we'll get free and we'll say, oh, that's good. I'm no longer in bondage to this. But what happens is because, because this vest is still on us, we, we still can attract the problems and we still can find the addictions of them and we still get linked to it. And eventually what happens is what we thought we are free from, we end up being back to it. So the problem is not necessary, the, the problem is not that we, that we have a lot of sin and we need to stop, we need to start doing good, we need to stop doing bad. Because we're going to eventually try to pull this out and stop this here, but it's always going to connect to us because we have this sin nature in us, because we are cursed, we are under slavery of sin. And so what we need is not only Christ to die on our behalf, but we need Christ to raise again, because when he rises again, he has power over death, because who knows in death you cannot do wrong. When you die, can you do wrong? No, I hope not. In death, you can do no wrong, but not only did Jesus die, but he rose again saying that he is God and that his promises are true and those who will believe in him will be forgiven of their sins and this sin nature would no longer connect them and so they will be free. So when the women woke up that morning and they went to the tomb, Jesus rose again because he had overcome and he conquered the grave and he said those who will believe in me would be free as well. And so what we need is to be free from this. And, and, and we, we can just try all we want, but this chain here is going to always link us. This vest is going to tie us until we find the key. And it's the key that frees us. Can you count one, two, three with me? One, two, three. And so what we do is when you open the key, everything just flies out. And then what happens is once in a while, we may get tempted and we go back to our old ways and the hook may be around but because we don't have the chains it doesn't link to us because we're no longer under his power you see so sometimes you may fail as a believer sometimes you may find that you go went back to your the bible says to your vomit and you may sin, but because the sin nature is gone, but because God has conquered this curse, so you're no longer a slave, it can no longer link to you. That's what God did on our behalf. Can we get an amen for that? Amen. God did it so that we would be free from the chains that would bind us. I remember as a young teen, as a teen, really trying to be religious. And I remember I felt like I was such a bad kid, and so I tried to read all the religious books. I tried to be ascetic, I punished my body, I punished myself, thinking that that would make God happy with me. I didn't know, you know, I went to church sometimes, and I went to temple sometimes, and studied other things, and I just could not figure it out. But I tried what I thought was sincere, but sincerity, didn't lead me to where I needed to go. I needed to be in the truth that God had brought for me. See, Jesus rose from the dead and overcame sin so that I can have victory with him. Resurrection weekend is not only God paying the penalty, but giving me the victory. So day three is God's gift to us, and we can either accept it or reject it. What do I mean here? When I was a child, probably somewhere between first and third grade, we used to live in Allen Parkway Village, which is uh, right across the, um, the freeway, well, right next to uh, Allen Parkway, uh, Buffalo Bayou, about a mile from the Houston Public Library and City Hall. 
And on weekends and during the summer, we would walk to the library about a, a mile trek. And, um, and then from there, we would walk up and go to all the stores. And back then, they had a store called Warworth. Warworth was really cool because it not only had a restaurant, but it also had, it sold food like, like uh, Walgreens, you know, where you sell candies and all that. But downstairs, they had a uh, restaurant, if I remember correctly. You know, all this week in preparing for Resurrection Sunday, I thought about this story, and I just want to share with you. Early elementary school, it was, there was probably about, I think there was about five of us. I can't remember clearly, but my older brother and I know his best friend was there. And um, we were hungry. You know, we, we, we would go out and, you know, our parents usually worked. And so we just kind of did our own thing when we could. And so we ended up at the cafeteria and we uh, managed to have enough money to buy uh, chicken fried steak, I think. But the thing was... We bought one chicken fried steak to feed five kids. And so we were all in line with just one plate. And, um, you know, we were just excited the fact that we had a chance to buy a chicken fried steak. And we got one chicken fried steak, and, and the lady behind us, she was looking. And at first, we felt a little uncomfortable, but then she asked a question. She's like, all of you kids are eating that one chicken fried steak? And I, I remember one of the older guys saying, yes. And she looked and she, and she was in shock. You know, she was just uh, this uh, Caucasian lady. She was surprised, you know, five kids trying to share one chicken fried steak. And so she, uh, in her the generosity of her own heart, she bought us one and so we had uh, another one. And so we had a second one to eat. And when I think about this story, I thought about the gift that she gave us. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't that we were good kids, you know? It wasn't that we were... And maybe she saw that we were good kids. Maybe that from that range of time, she thought these kids were nice. Uh, I don't know. But it wasn't because we were good kids and that she gave us this, but it was just the fact that she had compassion on us and she gave it to us. I think about God. I think about God when he gives his gift to us of not only forgiveness, but eternal life and of a life that's meant so that we can live and we can find our purpose within the body of Christ so that we can go out and, and live the life that God has meant and, 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 and prepared for us. I think about God's gift and just like this lady, God didn't have to give it, but he wanted to. And even more so than this lady, God did it because we were his children and he wanted us to be in relationship with us. He wanted to have a relationship with us. Ephesians 2 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. It wasn't because we were good kids that we were given that food. It was because someone was generous to us. And in the same way, it wasn't because or it will never be because you've done good things that God has forgiven you or given you or forgive you of your sins. It will never be that. It's because of God's love. That's it. So if, you never, if you've heard about God, but you're not sure what you need to do, the easiest step I can tell you is to accept and receive the gift he has for you. That gift is free for you to do. The requirement is simple. You've got to repent and believe. You have to decide that what you heard is correct and that you have lived a life that is far short, uh, short of what God has required. And you must turn away from the way that you live to take on what God has for you. Because what God has for you is greater than what you have for yourself. You must receive the gift of eternal life. That is the gift that God has already promised for you. He puts his hand out, but if you never open the gift, then it's never validated or used. See, when you do this, you acknowledge that God's ways are better than your ways, and you choose to live in his ways. We choose to leave the life that we want for ourselves that we think is better and we recognize that what God has for us is better. And I can tell you from a kid that grew up in Allen Parkway and wanting to do you know, stuff that was just at that point, you know, now in retrospect, they're pretty stupid. You know, wanting to get into gangs and doing all that to gain respect, but then finding that true love and confidence in God allows you to do everything else that could change your life. That you don't have to be someone's tail, but you can be heads because God has called you to stand up firm. That you don't have to be second to someone just because you are a refugee, but that God has saved you so that you can lead, or so that you can live, so that you can bless others, or so that you can step up. God did that. And God will do that for you today. 
If you're feeling down and out or you're feeling you don't deserve what God has for you, then I have good news for you. No one deserves it. Even those of us who dress crisply to church, we don't deserve it, but it's God's goodness. And so this morning I say it is God's goodness. It is God's goodness. See, we love greater after God loves us. We are able to love greater. We give more generously. We think well and better of others. We overcome obstacles easier because we know God is on our side, but not only that, but we choose to let things go more easily. We have a peace when things don't go well. I remember when 9-11 took place. It was one of the greatest church attendance moves in the history of the church because people, the first thing they went to is to find God. Now we live in America, sometimes we are convinced that we are okay. We build our own buildings, we drive cars that we've made, and we forget how great and majestic God is, but all it took was a little water and it messed up our whole city, guys, Harvey. And guess whose fault that was? That was not God. Because flooding, God didn't cause the flood. We try to control our own destiny and we find out that we end up causing harm to ourselves. But God has a plan for us. See, God wants us to turn away from our sin and that's called repentance. John 3, 16 tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But here's the other thing. Verse 17 is what most people don't know. Everyone knows John 3, 16, but not many people know John 3, 17. And I want to read that to you. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Did you get that? For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world. But he says, but God sent his son into the world that the world may be saved. God's purpose in sending in Jesus was for all of us to be saved, to be in relationship with God. Because God already knows that we condemn ourselves more than anyone else could condemn ourselves. We know when we do wrong. We know that we fall short if we are honest with it. But God said, I didn't come to point out your faults. You already know that issue. I come to show you the way out. So this morning I ask you, do you need a way out? So this morning I ask you, if you're a believer, can you show someone the way out? So this morning I remind you that we are to be those who show the way out to others. There is no I'm greater than you and I'm better than you because we all were free from these chains. And if it's somebody that we love, the last thing we want is for them to walk in chains in their life. And so we do it because we want people to experience freedom. We do it out of compassion because our God is a great God and he has broken our hearts for the things that break his. And so when we see people who do not know Jesus, we know what that's like. Because God can change everything in our life. I tell you from a refugee who thought he was second class and, and I took ESL for three years and I was horrible. I failed social studies. I had a complete perfect F. Your, the self-esteem was crazy because, you know, your name cannot be pronounced properly. So in a classroom of 40 kids, most of them were African-Americans or Hispanic, depending on which school we went to. We were the smallest of the group. And so we, I always felt that I was less than everyone else. Not, not being able to pay for my way. You know, when kids had parties, I share this with my, my wife a lot, and she, she loves me for it, and she always tries to remind me to not live like this. We have parties and kids would volunteer to bring things in. And one year, I remember I volunteered to bring in cups because after two years of seeing my friends bring in cups and spoons and napkins, I thought my mom and dad would be okay. And my dad convinced me. I took those cups out trying to bring them to school. My dad said, no, we, we can't give away those cups. We need them. Thinking that I had progressed, but finding out that I, was, I did not have what I thought I had. So it kills the self-esteem until you recognize that you, and you think that you are not important, not valuable to anyone. But the Bible tells us that God came for us. And that God came to save us. 
And that not only that, but he came to change the patterns of our thinking and to transform us by the renewing of our mind, by his Holy Spirit. He places his Holy Spirit, his sign in us, empowers us to do things that we could not do on our own. And so when God saved us, his intention was to empower us so that we can go out and be his vessels, to be his representation in a world. So when we follow God, God can move us from the direction that we thought we were heading, from where we thought was cursed, to where God can bless us in every step. And so where we go, we say, wherever I step, blessed kingdom is here. Wherever I go, this place is blessed because I have arrived. And when I understood that, Everywhere I went, I knew that God had sent me, and I made it a point that every place I go to, it is blessed. You can talk to my employers. You can talk to the churches that I've worked with. The churches always are better when I enter and better when I leave. Why? Because that's the principle that God has taught me, and I believe that's the same principle that God wants every one of us to emulate. Because when God enters the picture, when Jesus shows up in our life, everything changes. Everything changes. So this morning, if I can remind you today, church, that when Jesus enters your life, everything changes. If you're not able to take care of your children as you should, and you don't have the energy to do the work that you need to do, or maybe you find that you're not able to lead the way that you thought, well, well let me remind you, if you're a believer, that when Jesus enters, everything changes. You just need to yield to him. And if you're not a believer, I just want to tell you today that you have one who loves you, who cares for you. He sent his one and only son for you. And this morning he says, I love you. I gave my life for you. But not only that, but I rose again so that you can experience not only forgiveness, but victory over sin and victory over your struggles. And that I am with you until the end. Meaning Jesus, God will always be with us wherever we go. Amen. 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 Let's give God a hand. That is the victory of a believer. And that is your victory this morning. If you will please rise with me. I want to ask here today. The Bible tells us that we not only believe, but there's at some point we must stand up and with our mouth we must confess that Jesus is Lord. I want to invite those of you here for the very first time, or you've been church for years. I want to tell you, those of you who have been to church for years, I was in church for years before I became a believer. As a matter of fact, I was one of the best Sunday school students. I knew the Bible. I won awards, and yet I was not saved. I was better than some Christians in my Bible, but yet I was not transformed. But it wasn't until that very day when I was asked one simple question. Regardless of whatever you know, the question was this, have you ever invited Jesus into your heart? Because at some point you have to ascend. You have to humble yourself and say, God, I need you in my life. Because humility brings about God's exhortation. He will exalt us at the right time but we must be humble enough to acknowledge where we are not. So you could have been here for the very first time hearing this message presentation, or you could have grown up and all this time you thought you were a believer, but may I ask this, it's better for you to clear it out today at this very moment than for you to leave and not know what happens because you never guarantee the next moment. The older you get, the more you realize that, amen? I have had youth in my church one week is excited, next day, I mean the next week is in ICU and then has to be taken off life support. I've had people that I thought would die live, but then the people that I thought would live died. So we're never guaranteed tomorrow, but what you are guaranteed is this very moment to make the decision. So I wanna ask you, if I, if I could just get you to think clearly right now and make a decision, if I just pray for you real quick in the name of Jesus right now, I bind the work of the devil right now for confusing people and not letting people understand their freedom in Jesus. I say, right now, in the name of Jesus, I bind you. Let these people hear. Let those online who hear this be clear in their freedom in the name of Jesus. I say right now, if you've never 
in your life invited Jesus into your heart, I want to ask that you do that today. And I'm not going to ask people to close their eyes because you know what? I want you to make a decision for yourself. And you know what? I want you to own it as well. I want you to say, I believe this is me this morning. I remember years ago, I did an evangelism service and in a room full of young adults and, and teenagers, it took a little girl who was, I think was nine years old to raise her hand. And finally, everyone else had the courage <laughs> because she had courage. I just want to say this. We don't need a nine year old this morning, right? But we need to make a decision. So if you've been to church for all your life, you were born here. I don't know. Maybe your mom had labor on the, on the door at the doorstep. Who knows? Vietnamese, we have a saying, we say, you know what, I was, I was a Christian in my mom's womb. I just want to let you know, God doesn't have grandchildren. He only has children. And he needs to know you by name because you acknowledge him. So this morning, if I, I just want to ask this. If you've, ever, if you've never received Jesus, if you never invited Jesus into your heart, and you want to do this today, will you please raise your hand? Don't wait for tomorrow. Don't wait till later, do it now. Is there anyone in here this morning, you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you never invited him to your heart and you wanna do that today? Will you please raise your hand? Why are you considering that? For believers, I wanna challenge you with this. The message that we're reminded of this morning is that we are not only to be Jesus to the people out there, but we are to extend that love and we are called into mission to tell people about Jesus. We're not to hoard these truths to ourselves, but we are to go out and tell people and to bring them into the church so that they can also be helped. And sometimes we forget about that. We get so entrenched with our own personal life, whether it's raising kids, doing work, our career, the challenges we face, our sickness, our health, our joy, whereas we like to do mountain biking or we're just doing our own little thing. What we need to do is be reminded that those things are second to what God has for us. We are first and foremost children of God and called to tell others about God. And whatever else we do is a springboard for that. So can I challenge you believers this morning? That by the time we meet together next year, now let's make it even easier. By the time this summer begins, that you will make it a point to share to someone about Jesus. One person, one person, one person. You're, you're, you're gonna, you say, I don't know anyone. Well, you start praying right now and ask God. And for those of you, you've been sharing, I wanna ask that you double the number that you've been doing it. So if you've been sharing to four or five people, do that make that 10? Because really it's about numbers. We just share to more people and more people and more have the chance to hear. The resurrected life is a life that shares. We cannot fully live the gospel if we don't share. And that's reality, even for us pastors, we have to do that too. The resurrected life is a life that shares the gospel. May I challenge you with that? You're not engineers only, but you're engineers as a springboard so that you can share the gospel. You're not doctors only, but you're a doctor as a springboard to share the gospel. You're not a business owner only, or you're just not a great student, but you're, those are your springboards to share the gospel. God has allowed you in that position so that you can have a wider exposure so that you can share to people about God. And if you don't know what to do, then you start off with the very least saying, you know what, I've been praying for people in this office. How can I pray for you if that's possible? You know what, I noticed that you have a hard time with this. Is there something I can pray for you about? Start off with prayer if you don't know what else to do. You say, God, show me where I am to speak. Show me where am I am to go. So that's the resurrection message for you. One last time, just for one minute. Is there anyone in here, you've never invited Jesus into your heart, and you want to do that this morning, you can raise your hand so that I know how to pray for you. Is there anyone in here today who wants to respond to this message? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you, God, because you have saved us and you've raised us, God. From where we thought our life had ended, you have given us new life. From where we lost hope, you give us great hope. We thank you because you love us. We thank you because great is your faithfulness to us. I ask that you would bless those in here, that Lord, that you will restore many to the joy of their salvation so that they can go about sharing 
the good news that you have intended for them. We thank you. We ask that you will minister to us each, refreshing our soul. And may we live the resurrected life wherever we go and keep everyone safe as they are in the bouncing house and eat things and that their stomach do not hurt. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Let's give the Lord a hand. We are so glad you came. I declare this place an altar. If anyone needs prayer, of course, as pastors, we will pray for you and our leadership team, we will pray for you as well. We will remain here as those of you who are dismissed, they head out. Yeah, there's breakfast. And at about 1045, I believe, is where all the other festivities take place. So have some breakfast. Enjoy the time out there. I hope that you'll connect with everyone else. I hope you get a chance to say hi to others. Those of you who are guests, we're so glad to have you. God bless you. See you in a little bit.